Mark chapter 7 and verse 14. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is God's word. You may be seated. So I've been meditating a little bit more lately on the idea of physical suffering physical suffering. An idea not new to me or any of you. We have many physical maladies in our congregation. It will always be 90% of our prayer requests. It will always be some of the things that we navigate and gravitate toward in our conversations. It is a major part of our lives and it's almost impossible to avoid. We have prayed for ingrown toenails. We have prayed for cancer and everything in between. These are real trials. They should not be minimized. Sometimes I think because they're physical in nature, that means they're not spiritual, and so we tend to downplay them, and we don't want to talk about them anymore. We get tired of it. Um, but they are indeed trials from the Lord that He intends to strengthen and refine us through all physical difficulties, even those things that take such tolls on our bodies. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, I had an endoscopy done, which if you don't know what an endoscopy is, that's where they zip tie a camera to a stick and put it down your throat and see what's going on in your tummy. And um, they took some pictures. And I'm going to take a major risk today that probably most pastors aren't doing today, which is to show you a picture of my stomach. Are you all ready for this? Here it is can't see that real good, but that is a picture of the inside of my stomach. Pretty cool, huh? And uh, you see two stomach ulcers due to general gastritis and GERD, as they call it. They biopsied those things, and there's no bacteria or cancer or anything growing on them. Uh, but they can cause problems down the road if they're not treated, so they've got me on this medication for the next three months to heal up those stomach ulcers. My dad has had stomach ulcers his whole life. I don't really have any symptoms yet, uh, at least related to those, but those can get pretty bad if they're not dealt with. So, not pretty, right? You want me to leave that up for the rest of the sermon? No. Christian said no. Probably not. Um, it's not supposed to be pretty, and that's kind of the point of why I would show you that picture this morning. I don't like seeing people's guts. I don't like seeing the TV shows where they do surgeries and they're trying to show, how, like that stuff's supposed to stay inside, right? Where we can't see it, like that's, that's me, right? I get that. Uh, it's supposed to stay on the inside. But Jesus grabs our attention today with a parable about the body. And some of the Pharisees might argue that the stomach is the most defiled organ because of all the stuff we put into it that we're not supposed to. But Jesus corrects them quickly, along with all of their hearers, that there is an organ far more sickly than the stomach. And that is the organ of the heart. The heart of man is what we deal with today in this 
text. Jesus has been changing audiences in the last few passages. Chapters 1 through 5, he's primarily preaching to those in Galilee and proclaiming the kingdom of God, uh, proving his divinity through these signs and wonders. But now he kind of changes directions um, and moves from the crowds to these specific individuals from circumstance to circumstance. He deals head on with the Pharisees, with individual Gentiles. He has these private conversations with his disciples. He heals blind people. He heals deaf people. He casts out more unclean spirits. But the purpose is still the same from the first few chapters, which is Jesus is demonstrating his authority and his power as Lord in all of these events. So Pastor Jay preached two weeks ago on the feeding of the 5,000, which Jesus shows his power and authority feeding the hungry. As he said, who is this Jesus? They couldn't figure him out. And then we saw Jesus walking on water only for his disciples to see. In the middle of the night, they thought he was a ghost, showing his authority as the Lord who passes by. And then Pastor Jack preached last week on Father's Day, where Jesus addresses the Pharisees and their hypocrisy, showing that he has authority over their traditions. Not only their traditions, but actually all of the law, Jesus has authority over. And today's text is a continuation of this heated back and forth between Jesus and the Pharisees. They had intentionally sought to ambush him. They've, they've gathered here to where Jesus was to catch him in some incriminating behavior. They want to ruin his reputation. They want to catch him doing something he's not supposed to do. They've been seeking to destroy him since chapter 3 is what Mark said back then. They've already attacked him and his disciples because they didn't fast like others do. He attacked them. They attacked the disciples, because they didn't keep the Sabbath, they were picking grain. And what does Jesus say in those circumstances? He says, well, I'm the bridegroom. Why would they fast while I'm here? When I'm gone, they'll fast, but I'm here. And by the way, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I'm Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus says. And so they reappear here in chapter 7 saying, hey, your disciples aren't washing their hands. Boom, got him. He's a fraud. He's not real. Look, he doesn't keep the traditions. They're not washing their hands before they eat, right? And so Jesus said to us on Father's Day, what hypocrites you are, right? Happy Father's Day. Thanks, Jack. Happy Father's Day, you hypocrites. Isaiah was talking about you. You reject the commandments of God to keep man-made traditions. And he gives the example of honoring mother and father. And he says that you're uh, bypassing the commands of God by using what you have as Corbin to God, as his gift, so it can't be used now for the honoring of your father and mother. Therefore, you're making void the word of God. He says many things you do like. That's just one example. Many such things you do. And so Jesus finishes that example um, about their hypocrisy, and then he continues this flow of th thought where the Pharisees began, the disciples eating with unwashed hands. They are defiled according to their traditions of cleanness and uncleanness. And God's law, of course, does speak about cleanness and uncleanness. That's a big theme in the Old Testament, right? Israel was called to be a holy people, set apart, undefiled from the pagan nations around them. There were foods that they were not allowed to eat, from meat, fish, bugs, all kinds of things that are laid out in the Old Testament scriptures. And this is not the first time that we've seen the idea of uncleanness come up in Mark. Mark knew his Old Testament well as he tries to uh, show us these themes. You remember the woman with the discharge of blood. And she was ceremonially unclean, not to be touched. And she touches Jesus. And instead of making Jesus unclean, what happened? He made her clean. Whoa! Preach, right? It's good stuff. And then Jesus goes across the Sea of Galilee to the Decapolis, which we met the sorriest man perhaps in all of Scripture. There's this man with a legion of demons who's naked, uh, living in a graveyard next to pigs, which is like unclean, 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 unclean. No Jewish person would ever go there. And what, is ha what does Jesus do? Jesus goes there with his disciples, and he casts out the demons, clothes the man, gives him his right mind back, and makes him clean. And so this comes out again in our text today. 
Jesus' lordship over clean and unclean things. What actually defiles a person? Blood? A graveyard? Pigs? Eating certain foods? Not washing your hands before you eat other certain foods? The real correction that we need does not have to do with outward appearances, things that we touch, things that we put in our mouths, things that we digest, but the real correction is a matter of the heart. This is where our uncleanness comes from. So three very simple points just to help you follow along. Uh, what defiles a person, what goes into a person, what comes out of a person. What defiles a person, what goes into a person, what comes out of a person. Look at verse 14. What defiles a person? He called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And so I, I really appreciate what Jesus does here because you've got these scribes and these Pharisees who sort of confront him publicly to call him out. They ambush him. They attack him, his reputation, his disciples. They want to show him to be a sinner disobeying the law of God. And in front of everybody, Jesus responds. He tells them how it really is. After winning the debate with the Pharisees about how they uh, are hypocrites, and Isaiah talked about them, he turns to the crowd. So he's already confronted the Pharisees, done with him, nothing else to say. He goes to the crowd now. Listen up, everybody listening to this dispute. He called the people to him again. Hear me, all of you, understand, listen. Jesus wasn't just trying to win against the Pharisees. He was concerned about the souls of the people that they were responsible for. This is the kind of stuff they had been teaching to the people. And he was concerned for them. Here were all these men and women living in fear that they might disobey man-made traditions, trapped in the slavery of legalism. So Jesus, out of love and compassion, not only corrects the Pharisees and the scribes, but then corrects all those who were listening to this. This isn't about winning an argument. This is about truth that sets people free from bondage. So he preaches, listen, hear, Understand, use your minds. And I think Jesus sets a wonderful example for us here because we know that false teachers are real, right? We know that there are those who come in as wolves among sheep seeking to devour and to deceive the saints. But I think in our circles, a lot of us really just like shooting the wolves more than we like saving the hearers. Do you know what I mean by that? I could give you a list of all the false teachers out there on the TV and on YouTube, and that would sound really heroic from the pulpit, right? Go, Pastor Dale. He's calling them out. He's telling them how it is. But if we never warn those who are actually trapped under those teaching, what good have we done? Jesus turns to the crowds. Who cares about the Pharisees and the scribes? Look at, look, look at the people. Now, some of you have aunts and uncles and grandmas and cousins who listen to sketchy stuff, and you're afraid to confront it. You don't want to stir the pot. You don't want to upset them. But what if you told them the truth, and the truth set them free? It might offend them at first, but truth is truth, and God's Word does the work. Many of you are here today because somebody told you the truth when you were being deceived, right? Aren't you thankful for that? Somebody told you the truth about it, about the way it really is? Somebody pointed you to the Bible, to Scripture, read the Bible with you? Jesus is still setting people free from man-made religion. Don't be afraid to point people to the Bible and tell them the truth. Souls are at stake. Listen, hear, understand. Isn't it terrifying to think that some of these scribes and Pharisees had followers? They were the very hypocrites that Isaiah warned about, and yet they honored the Lord with their lips, and their hearts were far from the Lord. They worship in vain. They were teaching hundreds of people to do the same. 
In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus gives that famous condemnation against the Pharisees, which is very, very strong and harsh. And Jesus says to the people, observe whatever they, the Pharisees, tell you. Listen to them. Most of the stuff they say is right. But do not do the works that they do. Their lips were right most of the time, but they don't practice what they preach. They tie up heavy burdens. They lay them on people's shoulders. They aren't willing to move a finger themselves, Jesus says. And, they fe and the fear is that they were producing more people just like them. Hypocrisy is not only dangerous, it is contagious. Hypocrisy says true things, but actually leads people away from the truth. And so it goes that when you have hypocrisy in the leadership, you will have hypocrisy in the pews. What was the nature of their hypocrisy? The doctrine of defilement was at least the one they were dealing with here. The doctrine of defilement. Jesus doesn't say, listen guys, don't worry about any of this. Defilement isn't real. They just made up all this stuff about cleanness and uncleanness. You can throw all this out the window. This is complete garbage, right? Ignore it all. No, Jesus doesn't say that. Defilement is real. Uncleanness is real. It's a serious problem, but they had it backwards. Verse 15, Jesus says, There's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. The word defile is the same word as unclean. It's koine. It just means common, right? We, saw, we say koine Greek, common Greek. Uh, it, it's a general word referring truly to all Gentile peoples. The disciples were eating food with unwashed hands like those outsiders do, like those pagans do, right? Like those Gentiles do. Jesus says they were not becoming unclean. They were not becoming like Gentiles by doing this. Defilement isn't about what goes into a person at all, whether or not they washed their hands before they ate certain foods or did the right routines. Defilement is about what comes out of a person. And he's just sort of introducing the topic here, which we'll uh, discuss further. Some of you may have a verse 16 in your Bible, and I don't in mine, which is an English Standard Version. Um, and just to address that really quickly, um, you may have a footnote or something that says verse 16 uh, says this or not in the earliest manuscripts and and that's what it's all about uh, we see a lot of silly posts going around about how the King James Bible right has all this extra or not extra stuff but real stuff all these newfangled translations they take out all the good stuff right because they they want to pull one over on people's heads which is just silly it's completely silly um, there's these things called manuscripts, right? <laughs> Which is where we get our Bible from. This is how Bibles are put together. And since the uh, time of the compilation of the King James Version, we've had more manuscripts discovered that are just earlier. They're, they're older. They're, they're more trustworthy in some ways. And so uh, some translations, um, you know, may put it in brackets or make, because verse 16 is just not in the earliest manuscripts. But what does verse 16 say? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. To which I say, amen. Right? This is not problematic, and you shouldn't make it problematic. Uh, the context, the passage, the main idea is nothing is altered by this verse, so don't be bothered. I would exhort you, though, to hear, to have ears to hear. What, what is Jesus saying? Um, long story short, Jesus is redefining defilement. He's not getting rid of defilement. He's changing how we understand it. This is what he did with fasting. This is what he did with the Sabbath. He's not changing the thing. He's changing how we understand it, the, our perspective. He's redefining it. He's Lord. He defines the terms. Defilement is real. He tells us how it works. Like fasting and like the Sabbath, that doesn't mean Jesus is undoing everything in the Old Testament. Jack told us last Sunday that he came to fulfill all the law and the prophets. The disciples could pick grain on the Sabbath for the same reason they could eat with unwashed hands, because Jesus is Lord of the law, and Jesus was with them. Jesus isn't against God's law. Jesus didn't come to oppose the word of the Lord. He was not against the Old Testament. 
Can you imagine Jesus undoing Psalm 19? The law of the Lord is perfect. Jesus says, never mind. Reviving the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. Jesus says, never No, of course not, right? The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Jesus did not come to oppose the law. The law of the Lord is perfect. Jesus is God's law made flesh. He is the word of God manifest in human body. We aren't disobeying the Old Testament when we follow Jesus. The Old Testament points us to a day when God's law would have a face and a name and a throne. They're following the law by following Jesus. Here he is, he fulfills the law, which means when we're in Christ, all the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament are simultaneously abolished and fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus redefines the law because he's the only one with the authority to do so. He's the word of God made flesh. He gets to tell us how this thing works. We follow him, we are following the law. The disciples, of course, are having trouble keeping up. Deja vu, right? I feel like I've seen this before. The disciples don't get it yet. And thankfully, they struggle to understand to our benefit because now we get a clearer picture of what Jesus means by the stomach and the heart. In the following verses, what goes into a person? Verse 17, he says, what goes into a person? <coughs> when he'd entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. So Jesus is alone with his disciples. They don't understand. They say, what, what did you mean by that? Jesus explains the parable of the sower to them back in chapter 4, which was to our benefit. And now we get... This even smaller uh, parable, which this is, this is, you know, seems, what's well, one verse? How could they not understand this, this parable, right? And Jesus says that, are, are you also without understanding, right? And we're reminded how it is, it is easy for, for many of us to misunderstand Jesus, mis misinterpret Jesus, even for believers or disciples, which is why we must be careful uh, who we follow and who we listen to. Um, it is the Holy Spirit who gives understanding to his word. Uh, but I would also say Christianity is an exercise of the mind. It requires thinking, which is why Jesus says twice here, listen and understand, understand, understand. It requires thinking. It's not all hyper-spiritual mysticism. We have to think. We have to use our brains. We have to sit down and study and work and pray and research. And the Lord graciously gives wisdom from his spirit. When we do that, faith and understanding go together, which is why Jesus gladly explains the parable. He doesn't say, you fools, I guess you, you, you don't know me at all. You don't know the Holy Spirit. No, he says, let me explain it to you. Here's what it means. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Well, what does that mean? Well, whenever you eat something, it doesn't go to your heart, right? Where does it go? It goes to your stomach. You know where it goes after the stomach, right? It goes to the port of John goes the outhouse, right? You can see Peter just give a little, little smirk on his face when, when Jesus said that part. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. It, how could it make you unclean? It doesn't even stay in the body. The body literally gets rid of it. How could it make you unclean? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him? It cannot defile him. It enters not his heart, but his stomach. And Mark interjects here and he says, thus Jesus declared all foods clean, which is a really big deal if you know the rest of the New Testament. Um, this was a major problem in the book of Acts and the churches that Paul planted. Acts chapter 15 in the Jerusalem council, when they're trying to figure out if Gentiles can be welcomed in with or without circumcision, circumcision required for salvation, right? They found out works are not required, hearty, amen, no, right? They don't have to be circumcised. But you know what they did say in Acts chapter 15? They would accept the Gentiles 
if they abstained from food sacrificed to idols, eating blood, or anything that was strangled. We'll let them in as long as they eat the right foods. It took so long for this thing to go away. And Jesus says right here that he declared all things clean, all foods clean. And Paul says that for himself, that I know all things are clean. Um, but it, this began, it was a continual problem all the way to the book of Romans and chapter 14. And Paul is still dealing with matters of conscience and believers and Jews and Gentiles. But Jesus tells us right here his own perspective on dietary restrictions and the law. And his answer is there aren't any. This was so hard to dissolve, for one, because it was a centuries-old tradition, but two, we really want our problems to be on the outside. If we can be considered clean or unclean just based on what we eat or don't eat, that's a no-brainer. Just don't eat the foods. You can be in control of your holiness, right? We can control what we put in our mouths, some of us, right? Um, and therefore, we can control whether or not God would accept us. But Jesus is about to flip the script. The problem with humanity is not on the outside. The problem is not an external thing that we can control. It's not something we can just avoid. The problem is not the stomach, but the heart. The problem is us. There's a lot of people who don't believe that. Many believe that man is inherently good. Jean-Jacques Rousseau said in the 18th century that man was inherently good. He argued that at one time we were noble savages. We were uncivilized, but we were good. What made us bad? Civilization made us bad. The world and modern amenities and social structures turned us into beasts. Therefore, how do we fix man's problem? We undo all the social structures. We change the world. We tear down all of these things that we've built up where there's nothing left but man and our innate goodness. Then we'll all be at peace. Most of y'all know better than that. I hope. But functionally, we actually agree with Rousseau most of the time. Functionally. We refuse to believe the problem lies within us. We believe all our problems would finally end if our circumstances changed. If the stuff on the outside changed, we'd be happy. All our problems would go away, finally. If we could do this differently, if we could move away, if we had more money, if we had a better family, if I was married, if I was single, if I had more time, if the economy was better, if politics were better, if the president was somebody else, my problems would go away. Jesus says it's not what goes into a man that causes the problems, but what comes out of a man. It's not what happens to us. The problem is us. Do you all know there was a shooting in Spindale this week? Right on Main Street in front of the old First Baptist uh, church building they're remodeling. Midnight on June 20th, two gunshot wounds. The guy was rushed to the hospital. Shooter got away. Just read last night they found him. Took almost a full week. He was in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Don't know who the guy is, or if he's from here, or whatever. Um, and we see this kind of stuff pop up in the news, and we think, this is awful. Somebody's got to do something about this, right? What are we going to do to fix this problem? Well, we need to do something about the drug crisis. And then we need to have an honest conversation about drug vi or, uh, gun violence, right? Then we need to increase crime prevention. We need to pour our money in the police department, make sure they have a task force and everything they need. And a lot of that stuff probably should happen. But what happens after we do all that stuff? People still shoot each other. And people still get murdered. Because Jesus tells us where murder comes from, doesn't he? We can change laws, but we cannot change the heart of man. It's the first core value in our mission statement. We are a church that seeks the transformation of human hearts. How is that possible, right? We, we know behavior and morality doesn't change unless hearts change. Jesus didn't come to wash hands. Jesus didn't come to change circumstances. He didn't come to make the world a better place. He came to circumcise hearts and make us new creatures radically transformed from death to life. 
And that's where he takes us in this last point of what comes out of a person. We need to ask ourselves, what is humanity's biggest problem? What is your biggest problem? Is it the bad stuff that happens to me? What if, what if there was a way that we could experience genuine, lasting, overcoming peace in the midst of all the bad stuff? What if it's not the bad stuff around us that necessarily needs to change? What if, what if we are the ones that need to change? Verse 20. He said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, Coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. Not what goes in, but what comes out. Food goes to the stomach, it is expelled. It has no binding on the righteousness of a person. It is meaningless. But what comes out of a man? Food does not come out of a man. Nothing related to dietary restrictions at all. Jesus gives this laundry list of sins that come out of a man. Almost hard to read, aren't they? They make us squirm a little bit. But more important than the type of sins that come out is the source of those sins. Food comes from the outside. Its source is irrelevant. It has nothing to do with our um, insides. It has nothing to do with us. But the source of these defiling sins is from within, from the heart of man. The word heart in scripture is used widely to refer to the center of our being. It's cardia, we get our word cardiology, but it's not talking about the actual organ of the heart. Literally used 800 times in scripture, and not one of those refers to the actual organ of the heart. It's the desire producer that makes us do things. It is the will and volition within us that shapes our behavior, our actions, our motives. It is the very core of who we are. I don't like that. Do you like that? It doesn't sit well. You're telling me I'm not a good person. Well, I'm not, right? Jesus is. <laughs> Jesus says that we're not good. In fact, Romans 3 says no one is good, not even one. Every person has a heart, and therefore every person is a sinner, and therefore every person is defiled because of the sinfulness of their heart. And I'm sure I've said this before, but it's, it's helpful, I think, for those of you who don't like the words like total depravity, right? Total depravity does not mean that we're as bad as we possibly could be, right? I'm not out here killing people at midnight on Main Street, right? Which, praise the Lord. But I'm capable of that, and that's what total depravity means. It doesn't mean that I'm as bad as I possibly could be, but it means every part of me is defiled. There's no part of me that is uh, good. I've inherited all of Adam's curse. Like, he's my dad and I got his genes from head to toe, right? I'm a sinner. We all are Sinners. It seems like a good time to give a John Calvin quote here. The heart of man is an idol factory. You've heard that before. Looking at the original quote, he actually called the human heart a perpetual forge of idols. A perpetual forge of idols. And what stands out about that quote is how automatic it is. We crank out sin by nature. We don't have to be taught how to sin. We produce idols like a factory. We just do it, and we do it perpetually. And again, this applies to everyone. Jesus is sh shattering their system of hierarchy based on merit and good works. Pharisees, Gentiles, sinners, tax collectors and rabbis, sinners, politicians and preachers, sinners, Billy Graham and Jeffrey Dahmer, sinners. Regardless of external sources, good works, ethnicity, ancestry, culture, sociology, 
even what we say or what we confess. The scribes and Pharisees taught the law of the Lord, and they were the biggest hypocrites of all. If you have a heart, you are a sinner. All of us, according to Jesus, then, are defiled based on our hearts alone. And it is Pride Month. The rainbow flag flies high. They stole it from Noah and they stole it from the Skittles. We are living in pronoun ins insanity. Gender confusion, sexuality knows no boundaries. Discipling children to question their biological makeup, we are told we must affirm or bear the consequences. It is blatant and unquestioned madness. When we see this going on in our culture, we think to ourselves, how messed up are they? Right? But you know what Pride Month ought to do for us? It provides a picture of what all of our hearts are capable of. We ought to be humbled when we see Pride Month. This came out of human hearts like mine. This is where we would end up left to our own devices. But there's good news. I know we're at the end here, but you've got to hear the good news, don't you? We can't change the nature of our hearts. But Jesus can. He can change the nature of our hearts. He promised that, actually, in Ezekiel 36. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey all my rules. You shall dwell in a land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. And we see this kind of fulfillment in no other scene than when Jesus hung on the cross, bleeding his holy blood for the uncleanness of man. In him, Colossians 2 says, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, being buried with him in baptism. You were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I could point to countless other scriptures. Hebrews 8, which we just read in our scripture reading. Jesus came to transform our human hearts, to save us from ourselves. Have you with your broken heart, sinful heart, depraved heart, desperately sick heart, called upon the Lord with that heart that he might sprinkle it clean? If it is truly a problem of the heart, that means there's nothing you can do to fix it. We can't fix it by outside circumstances, changing our environment, eating or not eating things, but it does require outside help. It requires spiritual intervention. God has to come through his spirit in the revelation of the man, Jesus Christ, through his death and his resurrection, to give you a resurrection like his own. He has to make you alive.
call on him. If you have any questions about the gospel, I'd be happy to point you to Jesus. Because the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. If you are in Christ and your heart has been circumcised and you've been baptized with him and raised with him, that's the best news in all the world. But you should know, and Jesus doesn't address this here, but you should know that we still have a problem with sin. We are totally depraved. But beloved, in your sin struggle, you should know that you are totally covered with the righteousness of another, fully forgiven of yesterday's sins, today's sins, and tomorrow. But in the circumcision of your heart, you also have now empowering aid from the Holy Spirit to run from sin, to flee temptation, to put to death the deeds of the flesh and walk by the power of the Spirit. Sin is still a problem, but when we do sin, we have an all-sufficient covering for all of it. And I think the best part in all this is that we see this world full of sin and evil around us. We read the newspaper and it sounds a lot like verses 21 and 22. We grow weary living in this world. We long for a city that hands have not raised. We long for a country that sin has not stained. That day is promised to us, not because Jesus will tear down all the social structures and decivilize humanity, not because Jesus will change the president and the laws and fix the drug crisis. Those things will certainly be dealt with. But the reason this day is surely promised is because when Jesus makes all things new, we have a vision of every tribe, tongue, and nation bowing the knee to Christ and confessing him as Lord. It won't just be a sinless earth because Jesus made it new. It'll be a sinless earth because Jesus made every heart new. We won't even have to teach one another, Melissa read to us today, because we will have the law of God written on our hearts. And that day is surely coming in which our hearts will no longer be perpetual idol factories, but they will be perpetual praise factories. Our hearts will join the myriads and myriads of thousands of thousands, every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea, and all that is in them singing with a loud voice to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. The human problem is a matter of the heart, and we can't fix it, but Jesus can and he will. Let's pray. Father, thank you for making us alive when we were defiled. Thank you for forgiving us our sins. Thank you for taking our uncleanness on yourself and giving us a righteous robe as though we've never sinned. Thank you for the precious truth of the gospel. Thank you for circumcising our hearts, piercing our hearts, in an irreversible, unchangeable, forever redeeming and guaranteeing us um, an inheritance that is undefiled and kept for us in the heavenly places. And so, long, we, Lord, we long for that, for that place. We long for that state. Um, help us to kill sin and to run all the harder toward heaven. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.